ahead and get started. So welcome. To go over quickly what the agenda is going to look like today, uh, we're just going to do a quick Office of Outdoor Recreation intro, kind of look at some of our grants, discuss our Every Kid Outdoors initiative, and then we're going to take a moment to kind of look at using the outdoors as a space for learning, um, identify what is an outdoor classroom, go into some grant details. Uh, we're uh, very lucky to have two wonderful presenters, um, Alex Papor from the Utah Society for Environmental Education and Derek Jensen from Utah State University. And he's gonna be presenting the Outdoor Classroom Grant Design Guide, uh, which is just gonna be a wonderful resource. Then we'll just look at some application dates, uh, how to use our online portal, and then open it up for the question and answer. So quickly, the Office of Outdoor Recreation mission is to ensure Utahns can live a healthy and active lifestyle through outdoor recreation. And one of the main ways we do that is through our grant program. So this year we're offering our um, outdoor recreation grant, uh, which is kind of for new outdoor recreation infrastructure, the restoration rec recreation restoration infrastructure grant for the restoration of existing infrastructure. And then we also have a mini grant. And then the one we've all come here to learn about, the Utah Outdoor Classroom Grant. Um, and some exciting things. Just last year was our first year. We were able to fund 19 outdoor classrooms and we awarded $167,000 for funding. So can't wait to do that again this year with all of you on this call. Uh, we love to promote the Every Kid Outdoors initiative. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to get our kids outside and enjoy the benefits of being outside. I'm not going to read all 10 of these, but this was kind of passed through the legislation or through the legislature. Um, as part of this, we also have EKO passports um, in English and Spanish. You can download those um, at that link below. Uh, get your kids to fill those out, send them to our office, and we'll go ahead and send you prizes. So we're always very excited to get our kids outdoors, and this is a wonderful way to do it. Um, so with that, let's jump right into it uh, to talk about the benefits of outdoor learning and kind of going into some of the initial stages of classroom planning. Um, I'm very, very happy to introduce Alex Purpura, the Executive Director uh, for the Utah Society for Environmental Education. Alex, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, um, but with that, please take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. It is so great to see you. And I am just thrilled that you are here joining us and that you are interested in outdoor classrooms at your school or organization. Um, we could not be more thrilled to help support this program. I really hope that the information that I'm going to share with you today is helpful in terms of getting some ideas flowing. I also want to be really clear. I'm going to be sharing some great information about UC um, focusing on the benefits of learning outside. I'm also taking over some slides from my colleague, Hillary Lambert, um, who is uh, out. One of her kids, I believe, was exposed to COVID. I know it's a crazy time right now. So I'll be sharing some really great information on outdoor classrooms. I will mostly be using some of her content. Um, but again, feel free to, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat and we're happy to attend to them. So just some quick background information about who we are as an organization. UC is the Utah affiliate of the North American Association for Environmental Education. We work to promote EE and community outreach to connect all Utahns to their natural world. We are an organization that doesn't do, do direct programs to youth. Instead, our programs are for adults, people like you, whether you're in informal education, K through 12 ed, nonprofits, we're here to support you in your efforts to bring environmental education to your organization or school. And one of the ways that we do that is through things like our Utah Green Schools class, Green Schools program and also promoting the use of outdoor classrooms. So we'll head on into the next one. So I, a lot of this idea around this grant really came up last year. You may have noticed that outdoor classrooms were in the news for a variety of reasons. And, you know, just to be a little tongue in cheek, I'll say like, you know, outdoor learning, it's so hot right now. We're very excited about it for a variety of reasons. Um, learning outdoors is a really great way to meet the challenges that are presented by our current landscape due to the pandemic, but there are Learning outside is also a really great way to reach learners in new and different ways and really extend your learning environment outside the four walls of your um, organization's building or school onto your school grounds and extending out into the community. There are so many incredible examples of ways that schools 
have been embracing outdoor learning um, over the past about two years or so. And I also just want to share too, we're seeing tons of Utah schools take learning outside in a variety of ways, whether that is uh, just bringing science outside or figuring out ways um, that they can bring learning outside for the duration of the day. Because so there's lots of ways that you can do this in your school or organization. In the K-12 environment, it may be how do we shift from having um, lunch inside to lunch outside and then starting to think about the school grounds as a place for learning? Lots of different ways you can strategize about this. Um, so, you know, we, we really also just, just want to say like learning outdoors is a strategy for our current times, but is a longer term solution and ways to really extend that learning and thinking about how we can imagine or reimagine what we want education to look like. And um, we have been really inspired by the applications that came in last year and seeing how both schools and organizations are taking advantage of this funding opportunity to really stretch their programs, do new and different things, but also meet their core mission. This doesn't have to be something extra. This is something that you can bring into the work that you are already doing to meet the needs of your students and your educators. So we'll go to the next one. So why take learning outside in the first place? And I know I might be preaching to the choir a little bit, but I do think it's important to just reflect on a couple of different stats and things that we like to share. Um, it's really important to take learning outside for a variety of reasons. The one that I like to cite the most is that youth eight to 18 year olds in the United States spend an average of 7.5 hours per day using entertainment media. And that can be watching TV, being on their phone, playing on an iPad. And as an adult, you probably, <laughs> that might resonate with you as well. Um, we're seeing uh, youth and also adults spend a little bit less time outside engaged in both structured and unstructured activities. Um, so this is certainly something that might be presented as a challenge. We'll go to the next one. But there is a lot of opportunity there. So when we think about learning, we might think about, all right, what are, what are students going to gain? Um, and then being outside is associated with uh, reduced stress levels, improved mental health and well-being, improved physical health, and also seeing increased student engagement and academic performance. And all of these are uh, linked to academic research. We also know, oh yeah, and we, we can keep talking about this one. I also wanna say, especially in relation to reducing stress, increasing mental health, those things occur for adults being outside. And I will say anecdotally from what we've heard from educators who have started teaching outside more frequently is that it's really great for their mental health as well. There are certainly some barriers and challenges um, to getting used to the outdoors as a teaching and learning environment, but those mental and health benefits are going to impact not only your students, but hopefully your educators and staff who are able to participate in uh, learning in outdoor settings. But please don't just take my word for it. Um, we know sometimes that when you, um, you might be applying for these grant opportunities and programs, you might have to justify uh, some of your reasoning with research. Um, and I can include the links as well for these to get sent out. Uh, the Children and Nature Network has compiled a number of one-page fact sheets that uh, list and cite a number of the academic research around outdoor learning. So I have specifically highlighted um, green schoolyards can improve academic outcomes and green schoolyards encourage beneficial play. So some of this documentation may be useful for you as you are writing your grant and also thinking about your outdoor classroom and also um, working on things like, you know, potentially justifying to other people at your site or organization or school why you're moving forward with this process. So we wanted to let you know that if you need some additional magic up your sleeves, we are here to help you out with that as well. We'll go to the next one. So especially for those of you who are in K through 12 environments, uh, learning outside supports our Utah State Board of Education standards, especially when we're looking at our science with engineering education standards. Being outside provides a myriad of opportunities to engage with phenomena and three-dimensional learning. 
It's a great way to get students engaged in that skill of observation and honing in on things. Um, it can also be a really great opportunity to like notice changes that happen in your schoolyard throughout the course of the year and directly tying those back um, to specific state standards. Learning outside provides opportunities to engage in problem solving and hands-on learning. And I also wanna to say too, through this process, and the grant process and you know if you are looking to kind of make that shift to taking students outdoors more it also provides a great opportunity to connect with partners and resources who can help make these standards come to life and also provide those deeper and richer community connections um, and using the outdoors as a space and conduit to make that happen we'll go to the next one um, I just wanted to, I'll quickly pause right there um, just to see if there's any questions in the chat. Okay, so just one about the slides. So that's kind of the, the justification and background. Why should you do it? Well, I'm sure that many of you already have an inkling of the why. So let's dig into some of the nuts and bolts around what exactly is an outdoor classroom. So one of the big things that I really wanna share with you is that anything that you can do indoors, you can do outside, which is important to remember when you think about what kind of learning you wanna plan for outside. And it's equally important when thinking about what is an outdoor classroom. So like a traditional indoor learning space, it's a space with materials and tools for learning, seating, space for conversation, writing, problem solving, and presenting. And there's a couple design principles that you'll wanna keep in mind throughout this process. As we go through these slides, you'll see a number of different learning spaces and they're really meant to inspire you. Um, and we'll talk about some of these other nuts and bolts pieces that you might wanna think about through this process. One thing that I quickly wanted to highlight at the top of this section is that we are talking about classroom spaces. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, nature play spaces, and those are really cool and really excellent spots for students and learners to engage in play, to engage in maybe taking some risks and challenges that they might not usually take on a regular playground. Um, this grant and the information that I'm sharing is really focused on what we were thinking of as like a structured outdoor classroom space. And we want these spaces to be well designed. So these are some guiding principles. Um, these are from uh, Nature Explore, which is an outdoor classroom company based in Lincoln, Nebraska. And they specialize in designing outdoor learning spaces and leading research projects into the benefits of learning outside. So these design principles will give you some ideas on um, how to start conceptualizing your classroom. And a lot of these will be in that guide that will be shared with you. Um, I'll highlight them just really quickly. So when we're thinking about this outdoor space, really try to think about it as how you would design an indoor space. We're look, thinking about well-defined, clearly marked areas. Signs are named, or areas are named with either signs or visual cues. Um, we're looking at using both natural materials and some built materials that are durable and can withstand being outdoors in a variety of conditions. And also thinking about um, how you can make this space really personal for your school or your organization. We'll scoot on to the next one. So here are some examples of thinking about how to create a well-defined space or clearly marked area. Um, so uh, you'll notice on the left, we have kind of this pergola with tables, um, it's an, an amphitheater space as well. So we've got a couple of different spaces. Um, I'll just say for like from an example from um, um, teaching a workshop at a local elementary school, um, for example, we would use kind of an amphitheater type space or space on concrete um, to uh, introduce the main lesson and then establish boundaries on our grassy areas or areas for exploration. So we're looking at how we're defining areas, spaces that are clearly defined for learning and spaces that might be clearly defined for exploration or other purposes, depending on what you're hoping to accomplish at your school or organization. We'll scoot to the next one. And I'll go ahead and answer this kind of this first question that came in. Does the outdoor space have to look like a classroom without walls or can it have much broader and varied boundaries? I would say absolutely yes. <laughs> it can look 
exactly, I, I would say like the classroom can look like it needs to look to support your learning goals and your organization or site's mission. We'll go through a lot of examples um, in this. And Greg, I'm not sure of the answer to your question, but I'm sure we'll um, be able to get to that in the Q&A. So we're also looking at thinking about how we can name these areas with signs or visual cues. This is a really great principle and practice, especially if you're looking to bring an outdoor learning environment into a school or a site where this is not something that you have traditionally incorporated. Setting those boundaries can be a really great way for to get students in that mindset of being able to go like, oh, we are outside and this is not for recess. This is not for play. This is our space for learning. Whether you're designating sites as your outdoor classroom, an exploration garden, a conversation corner, whatever works for you, um, being sure that you're including signs, visual cues for how that space is broken up is really important both for you as educators so you know what exactly you know what exactly your space is for and that your learners know the purpose of the space that they are in we'll go to the next one all right so um this one's really great so this is to make um making sure that areas are visible and meet regulatory and academic standards so of course we're extending our learning environment we want to make sure that it is safe and that it extends to the basic needs of a learning environment so for example um ada accessibility and student learning accessibility um also thinking about a visual characteristics sound projection and instructional standards. So um, this right here is an example of Judge Memorial, which is located on the East Bench in Salt Lake City. So in 2020, they used um, simulcasting on iPads to teach in-person and virtual students at the same time. And to prepare teachers to do that in outdoor classrooms, they actually mapped the Wi-Fi in each outdoor classroom area and noted where they needed to add hotspots. So all these outdoor classroom areas are now accessible to virtual and in-person learners. So one thing that you may want to do is depending on um, what you're anticipating using that space for. Maybe you are going to be in your outdoor space and you still need to be prepared to use a one-to-one -one device with students. You'll go, you're going to want to figure out where that Wi-Fi is accessible. If you have students who um, need to ensure that they can hear the student, maybe you're in a classroom where um, your educator might be using a microphone, um, it's really important to go ahead, walk around your school or your site to make sure that the acoustics um, where you're at um, work. Because I know sometimes in doing a site visit last summer at a school in my neighborhood, we thought we had a really great space, but the road traffic just wouldn't make it um, accessible or a great spot um, for students to learn. I know that's a lot of things to consider, but you'll want to keep those in mind. We want to make sure that your outdoor classroom space is accessible for all um, and can also is, is going to meet your needs for a variety of ways. Okay, next one. All right, so this uh, using a variety of natural materials and plants to make your space lovely. Um, this actually speaks to some of the research on the environment as a third teacher. In a classroom, students can learn from the instructor, each other, and from how they interact with their surroundings. Um, educator and author William Ayers says it this way, the environment tells students what to do. And it's important because your design will key students in on how you want them to behave. Do you want them seated and listening? Do you want them working and collaborating in small groups around benches, running in an open space? So you'll want to think about designing that space based on what you want your students to do there. Um, you can also bring in lots of natural elements into an outdoor classroom. So thinking about things like, um, zero escaping, bringing in local or native plants. Um, also maybe thinking about garden spaces, both, um, you know, vegetable gardens, also thinking about like edible plants and other things. So there's lots of ways that you can think about how you might want to incorporate those natural materials. And again, that might be really different for a school or site um, in St. George, Moab, Monticello than it would be for a school or a site up in um, Logan. Um, so really think about those natural elements that you'll want to bring in. Okay, next one. 
again, this kind of touches on that same piece is really think about personalizing your classroom um, with regional materials and also bringing in the community. Um, I know that as part of this grant, we're also looking at ways that we can kind of extend the use of that classroom um, beyond just um, the day-to-day -day learning environment. So bring your, if you have community partners or a community center that's located by your school or site that might also want to take advantage of the space, bring them in to collaborate, see what else they might need. Let students help to plan some of these spaces. And I know sometimes it can be really difficult depending on the age of the students that you are working with, um, but it might be as simple as a um, group project to paint all of the, the benches or seating that are going in that space really giving some, some ownership, making the space that you are building feel specific to your site, your organization, your school, and making it meaningful. And making it meaningful means that your, uh, your classroom will be used and loved um, both by students and educators and community members who are there. Next one. All right, and of course, choose elements that are dur durable and create ways to store equipment. So in Utah, we have snow sometimes, hopefully, <laughs> rain, uh, wind, all of these elements, they are real in our outdoor spaces, but there's creative ways to protect and store your learning materials outside. You might also want to think about, you know, ways that you can bring materials from the outside inside. Um, I will say like teaching outside, like clipboards <laughs> are 100% your friend uh, in, in these situations. So, you know, some examples here is that um, looking at this classroom on the lower right hand corner, all of these benches also serve as additional storing areas. And if you have some storage outside, it also makes it easier if you do need to quickly adjust to inclement weather or other conditions. And it makes it more likely that other uh, educators on your site or at your school will be more likely to use this space if they know they can access materials that are already there and outside. So again, you know, you're thinking not only just about um, how you're going to learn there, but how that space can be used and be functional um, for those folks who are going to use that. We'll go to the next one. Um, so in thinking in, in terms of like concept mapping and plan, um, I know we're gonna talk about this really great design document, but I do wanna stress kind of up top too is that you do not have to be a landscape architect to create a great plan for this application. Um, you just need to have a vision and an idea and the um, guiding documents for this grant will help you work through that piece. Um, so, you know, don't be concerned about, I don't know how to build this, or I don't know how to do this. You just let your, um, you know, your ideas and vision help guide you for this process. And there are folks out there, um, both through Office of Outdoor Recreation and some of the other um, guest speakers today who are here to help you out to make your vision a uh, reality in this proposal. Next. All right. So, you know, step one from when you are starting, and I, I'm not going to read this, this is from Green School Yards America, is okay, we've shared a bunch of great ideas and design principles. So where on earth should you even start? Starting um, is by surveying your school grounds or your site or organizational grounds to keep in mind some of those things that we talked about. Um, you know, take a, a screenshot of your site from Google Earth, walk around, really get a feel for what the acoustics are like, where is the shade at um, during different times of day, understanding any um, ADA access and how easy it is to get inside, to go to the bathroom, to access the sink and all that good stuff. All right, let's move to the next one. And so this is an example of um, kind of working through that. And I, um, this is at Our Lady of Borda's Catholic Church, um, which is where Hillary has um, helped to um, add an outdoor classroom at this site. So like we mentioned, they went ahead and took some screenshots of that property so they can look at delineating the areas, walking the grounds and making a plan for each area. Okay, next one. 
And again, your uh, images don't have to be picture or pixel perfect. Um, this is a really crude example of this outdoor space before the project taken from Google Maps. We'll go to the next one. So this is something that Hillary made as well when she was planning this classroom. She just went ahead and did it on a blank slide in PowerPoint. You can also do it with pencil and paper. It's not fancy, but it shows the goals. I'm um, an art area a willow tunnel and a space for reading. So like we had talked about earlier, we're thinking about really delineating these spaces. Um, we have our areas for storage marked out um, and we're looking at also including some perennial flowers, native grasses, also well, there, there will be wood chips. So again, those wood chips also help to delineate those spaces. They might not be signage, but they're a visual marker for when you're entering a space. And then we just, she just created an overlay of this on top of the uh, photo of the space, just to kind of give an idea of what that spot might look like. So we'll go to the next one. All right, so some considerations, just again, um, anything you can teach inside, you can teach outside. So um, really think about how you can mirror indoor resources in the outdoors and think about how you can extract elements of work that you already do and permanently place them outside. Hillary recommends a book. Um, it's called Cultivating Outdoor Classrooms by Eric Jensen and that has an extensive community survey that you can use to solicit interests and desires. Um, I am also happy to, you know, as questions and things pop up and things arise. Um, last year, I, I will say like I had a couple of folks reach out to me with questions about their site and space and I am more than happy to do that again this year. And if you have more nitty gritty uh, questions about outdoor classroom spaces, um, Hillary, I know would be more than happy to help with that. And I hope I did her spot of the presentation justice. And I am going to um, just quickly look at this one question that popped up before we head into the next one while it's still fresh. And this one says, so far, the program seems to focus on building an outdoor facility as a classroom. Is this a limitation of the grant? What about using existing structures or natural environments as the classroom for conducting lessons? And I just, um, I think that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that one. And I don't know if the outdoor rec team wants to take that on now or save it for Q&A. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Yeah, I mean, I think we can we can get into that in a little bit once we uh, pivot here. Um, but really, a big thank you to Alex, um, also Hillary Lambert uh, with the Wasatch Mountain Institute. They've been so great in helping us plan and design this. Um, so thank you very much. Use them as resources. We'll have their contacts out at the last slide. Um, now, as we pivot into the actual grant, we've talked about kind of concepts and about early stages of planning. Um, let's take a look at what the actual grant is. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing the Office of Outdoor Recreation Program Manager and Acting Director, Tara McKee. She's going to go a little bit into the details of what the grant is, eligibility, and some of the nitty gritty. And then we get to hear from Derek Jensen from Utah State University who designed a uh, design guide specifically for this grant program. It's really just incredible and help you kind of start from scratch and go all the way in. So with that, uh, Tara, please take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you'll wanna to go to the next slide. So um, just to, uh, it's great to be with all of you today. This is, um, a program that we have made available because while we'd love to fund programming at this time, our programming grant has not yet been uh, replenished with funds from the legislature. So in um, to support uh, great uh, programs out there, uh, we wanted to provide a grant to provide infrastructure. Uh, that may be needed for these great programs, something that um, really supports outdoor learning that can be STEM topics, health topics, uh, Native American studies, art, social studies, and I should add, um, of course, outdoor recreation skills. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but uh, please look at that Every Kid Outdoors initiative, you know, any of those things that uh, support that. Um, are great and will um, increase your score. So, um, 
anyway, so this is infrastructure only. So there needs to be something uh, permanent to that. To if, and hopefully that answers the question, but um, I did wanna make the point that, um, it, you know, this should really fit with the area. If you, if you're, if you have some regional um, things that, you know, are particularly um, unique in your area, um, say it was, you know, a tribal group, and I believe we did fund um, something with the Paiute tribe, uh, you know, incorporate um, elements and design elements and aspects that make that unique, and, and that will be really appreciated. Okay, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, so the details are, it opens up um, January 18th. That, that's Tuesday, right after our, our Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And it will be open for two months. I will be, we will be sending out an email to all of you with all the, the links on that morning. Um, this is a, uh, mini grant. So um, it has a streamlined application. It's up to a $10,000 award. Um, and, you know, you'll just want to have a basic concept plan for uh, the classroom uh, to, to really help the scores to understand what you're doing. Uh, please line up the partners for that in-kind work and, and those that are contributing funding create a project, a timeline to show how that project's going to be moving along and can be completed within 18 months. Uh, many grants have, have 18 months to be completed. And then eligible application applicants. So, uh, you know, of course these are great for, uh, you know, a campus centered located um, outdoor classroom kind of traditional as it was brought up, um, you know, kind of an actual outdoor classroom. Um, but it also can be great for communities. And we have funded ones where it's nonprofits or local governments. Um, it should say tribal governments and local governments um, that uh, can host educational sessions for K through 12 students on a regular and frequent basis. So if there is something going on, you're, you're hosting a number of field trips, this is a really great opportunity to have something to be able to either seat uh, these students for this outdoor learning environment. Um, and then, you know, primary use is 4K through 12 students uh, with that nature-based STEM curriculum, or like I say, outdoor recreation activities you'll wanna be providing those specific examples of the kind of curriculum or outdoor activities that you'll wanna do. So this is not for adults and it's not for the preschoolers um, because those tend to be uh, the playscapes. And I know there were some images of some kind of playscapes. Those will not score well on this with the scoring committee. Um, in some cases we will, fund nature playscapes, um, but that would probably be best used in a different, in our regular mini grant. And you can get in touch with me about that to make that um, a really good one. Uh, Long-term plans, and you really need to show this, that's key. Um, this isn't just for COVID era, this is for a long-term. So what, what are those plans? Um, and you know, what are the plans for the, the student, the educational administrator that you might have for your nonprofit after school programs in the community? And then you've seen these photos earlier. These do show, um, as noted, uh, some uh, kind of traditional classroom things. I just wanted to uh, point out some of those that, that came in last year that were unique. Uh, we did have a um, elementary school that that does that did submit and was awarded funds to build a greenhouse um, set up to be able to teach about um, the agricultural heritage of the area. So it was um, very awesome. They partnered with uh, the local Hell's Backbone Grill as one of their partners and a number of others to fund this and have did a really great job of providing, you know, really having 
a fabulous plan to be able to use this classroom year round, even in the cold. Um, another one that you don't see here, and, I, and I'd love to get a photo of it when it comes to pass, but this may answer that other question of not just a typical um, kind of classroom setup, but um, the, the Utah Olympic Legacy Foundation was awarded a grant for something that was a little less typical. It was a portable outdoor classroom. It was set up to uh, go around and visit various schools to teach um, and bring together, you know, for Nordic sports and snowshoeing and to provide opportunities for students across the area. So that one was eligible. Um, so I hope that helps you to think about it. So that um, would be very different and uh, we'll provide other opportunities or, or other examples in the future of some of the other ones. But I think that one was the most unusual and uh, they put together a great application to kind of show, especially that they were reaching um, populations that um, really had, um, were coming from lower income homes that wouldn't otherwise have these opportunities, which was a key um, with that one. And now we have uh, Derek Jensen, who has been working on this for about a year or more, actually, Derek. Um, he is a, a grad student at Utah State University, and he has created this design guide. Uh, we had a sample of it last year, and now we have the full design guide, and he's going to introduce it to you. Yeah, like Tara said, my name is Derek, and I've had a great opportunity in the last year to, to dive deep into this subject and provide some design expertise and guidance for you guys going in this process for the first time. Um, and uh, my email is not here on this slide, but I'm gonna put it in the chat right now, just in case uh, anyone would like to reach out to me. I'm totally happy and willing to offer help, advice, um, or answer questions about the design guide as you guys jump into it as well. Um, so like, like I said, I'm here to provide some design expertise and I want you, I want you right now to set the grant aside for just a minute and open your mind to, to more. Um, this, this is an image of the plan of Chicago. It's uh, done by a city planner designer named Daniel Burnham in the early 1900s. He was one of the leaders in the city beautiful movement. And he, he's very famous for this quote where he says, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood and probably themselves will not be realized. Let your watchword be order and your beacon be beauty. Think big. And, and I included that because I want, it, I want it to help you think and inspire you to push a little bit. Don't, don't just think of this grant as being the, the end. Think of a vision for your site plan and the grant being something that can support that vision. Um, and <clears throat> I just know I've seen how plans can inspire people to do great things. And I would encourage you to really push for greatness on this, even though it's a small, it's a mini grant, but help it to contribute to your grander vision. And so that's kind of the lens that, through which I'm approaching this. So I've included uh, just a simplified design process for this. Uh, one of the things I'm interested in my study is the design process. And there's a number of ways you can go about designing. Alex touched on a number of good, por good points and principles, and I've simplified it here into four steps. Number one, defining a vision, as we've talked about. Number two, building a team, um, including people into your process so that you're not alone. Um, and as I've reviewed the literature on this topic, that's one of the most important things that every single design guide and, and author recommended is building a team and gathering public input. So there's some sections on that. Step three, getting to know your site. That's what Alex was talking about, doing an inventory and an analysis. Uh, you know, looking at where shade is, where the sun is, where the noise is, all that kind of stuff. And then number four, creating your site plan, which is where I walk you through how to actually make it visualized, draw it on a piece of paper, and then you can submit it. So the first three steps there are sort of preliminary to, or to creating the actual visualized plan. So here's just a sample page from the worksheet. Um, uh, you'll see the step is there, and then in green, are the individual tasks for each step. And it's created as an interactive PDF so that you can go in and type and fill in these things and use it as a workbook. Now, keep in mind, 
the things in this design guide are not necessary for your submission. They're totally just there as a tool for you to walk through the design process. So don't feel like you have to fill in everything on there for the submission. It's just there for your benefit. Um, and one other thing I would mention is don't try to fill it out in your web browser. Otherwise, it won't save when you exit. So download the design guide and fill it in there um, if, you, if you're going to go with, with that approach. So, OK, go ahead and go to the next one. So here's the step four where you're actually building your site plan. And I've, I've worked a lot with beginner designers at the university and um, also in some of the case studies that, that I've done, which I'll show in a minute. And I found one of the best ways to do it is to, to start with materials and means that are accessible to everyone. You know, as a landscape architect, I typically, typically draft with trace paper, with a computer, with an engineering scale. But I've simplified this down and provided worksheets for you guys so that you can do it with just paper, pencils, and pens. So here's what you would start with. You would just measure it out and draw a, an outline of your site plan here. Next slide. Then I've had another worksheet where you cut out bubbles, sized bubbles for all the things that you want to put on your, on your outdoor classroom. And then you can move them around without having to commit to a drawing. It will save you a lot of time and it will free up the thinking process so you can consider how things should be arranged before you spend any time drawing. Next, next picture. And then you can draw it out on the plan. It doesn't have to stay as just circles and squares. You can draw it out into whatever shape fits with your site plan well. Next slide. And then you're going to spend some time adding detail to it, still just really lightly with a sketched pencil. Next slide. And then uh, refine some of the line work, erase the, uh, the extra lines that you didn't use when you were exploring. Next slide. And then you color it and label it for your site plan. And this really is ideal for uh, what, what you could turn in for your grant application. This is, this is beautiful, it's simple, it's clear to read, and it's easy to show what's going on. Um, and then I've included one extra optional step. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Now this is the same one. It's just a little bit refined with shadows and textures. This is unnecessary. It takes some time, but it can be very helpful to communicate your vision and persuade other people to jump on board with it. As I was saying before, make no little plans. Well, if you have something like this, you could take it around and, and uh, buy for more funding from other sources. And uh, I think a more engaging graphic like this may help inspire other people to jump on your project as well. But keep in mind, this level of detail is not necessary for this grant. This is just an example to show you what can be achieved just with paper, pen, and pencil. Um, and before you go to the next, go back one slide real quick. Um, just note in here, there's a lot of elements. There's like a nature play area, a music play, a, a messy materials water play area, a garden, and a few outdoor classrooms. Well, this grant would not fund all of those things. So you would you could turn in a, an application like this and say, we're going to fund the outdoor classroom over there by the evergreen forest. And that's all that we're applying for for this, for this grant. And then next year, maybe you can apply for the other outdoor classroom. So, but having an overarching vision um, will help guide each decision along the way. And so, like I said, design as if you're not just going for this grant. Design as if the sky's the limit and then use the grant to support your vision. Next slide. So here are just some of the worksheets I was talking about. There's a scaled base grid, so you don't have to use an engineering scale. You just go with one with the boxes for your measurement. And then uh, the exploration concept cutout bubbles. I've given some like sample sizes and recommendations on what things would fit in that size um, on your base plan. So you can cut those out and label them and move them around however you like. Next slide. So <clears throat> this is one thing I wanted to include from one of the case studies I did. I worked with a school actually in Ogden um, involving the teachers and the students there in a public participation process. And I was just blown away by how, how amazing it was to work with the students. These, uh, you can see me there teaching the students the, this design process. I walked them through the design guide that you guys are provided. Um, and they created that site plan there in the middle all together as a class. And then they broke off as individuals and all of those diagrams on the right hand side were drawn by eighth grade students by themselves without any additional help. So I, I just wanted to include that to show you an example of you could do this with your students if you're in a school setting and um, engage the community around you. You know, you're not alone and you're designing for other people to use. So try to find out what they want in the site and then represent their, their ideas too. Next slide. 
Um, and so I've included a number of case studies. There's five in total. This is just a sample of a few of them of what they look like in general. Um, and it will give you a little cross section of, th of areas throughout the state that you can go and visit in person. Every single one of the case studies is open and free to the public to access. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at those case studies for inspiration on uh, materials you can use, ideas for what to do with your outdoor classroom. And then if you really like one, go and visit it, visit it in person and uh, check it out. The facility managers at each of them are more than happy to, to meet with and answer any questions. I met with all of them and interviewed them and they were phenomenal. So give those a look at. Next slide. And that's it for me. Excellent. So we did put the link um, for this design guide right into the chat at the very beginning of the webinar. You can also get it uh, just at business.utah.gov forward slash outdoor forward slash grants. And if one of my you know, fellow staff members wants to put that link in, that'd be great as well. Um, so what we've tried to do is, is give you the initial concepts, uh, give you some stages in planning, and then introduce this amazing design guide to walk you through the entire process to get you ready for your application. So I want to just take a moment and review the resources offered. Um, you know, we do have the 2022 York Program Guide, which goes over all of our guides, but it's very helpful when you're looking at things like matching and eligibility. You know, this is a matching grant. There are eligibility considerations. Uh, we do have the Outdoor Classroom Toolkit, uh, which includes a lot of resources like articles and planning, um, a lot of examples. If you're curious what's on the actual application, you can down, download the entire application at this site. Um, you know, you can prep for it offline. Um, you know, there's going to be a budget included um, and there's a budget template you can download. We also have a step-by-step -step webinar if, if you want a little help in how to figure that out. Uh, staff contact uh, Tara and myself, Patrick Morrison. Please reach out to us with any questions whatsoever throughout the entire process. We are so happy to help and we really believe in the purpose of this grant. Um, so we will do anything we can. As um, I said, there, there is the application that is online. Um, you know, you'll go to our portal, create an account um, and apply there. But we do want you to be able to do it as much as possible. Maybe you'll be doing it outside in the future site of your classroom. So to do this, you can download that sample application, get a head start writing in a word processor. That way you can kind of edit, use spell check, use grammar check. Um, when you are in the portal, please, you know, save the work online. Frequently, you know, we, we do see connection errors or server issues. We just don't want you to lose anything. Um, and then if you are using any of the templates, you know, there's a timeline template, uh, there's the, the budget template, just make sure much like this design guide that you download it first and then complete it and then upload it. Otherwise it will appear blank. Um, all the application links are available at our grants webpage. Um, and then the grant period opens January 18th. Um, and that's when we'll include the portal link on our website and you can go ahead and get started. Uh, just a quick look at some of the application attachments that are required for this. Um, we need a W-9 form. Uh, that's how we prove, uh, you know, you are who you are, and also how we reimburse you for this. Um, we, we need your logo so we can promote the work, the conceptual site plan that you're going to do after you work through this awesome design guide. Um, letters of support. I just really want to take a moment to to encourage you to reach out to community members for letters of support. Uh, you know, we did have a number of applicants last year who every every letter they had kind of came within their, their school, if it's an elementary or, you know, the junior high. Uh, it really does show a greater depth of support if you're able to not only get those letters from inside your organization, but also outside, you know, community members or parents, um, you know, clubs. There's a lot of opportunities to show support outside of your organization, and we definitely encourage you to do that. Uh, statement of responsibility is just showing who's going to take care of it. You know, we, we do want to see these uh, last with uh, long-term use plans, but also, you know, maintain some sense of um, sustainability. So who's going to take care of the classroom? Um, you know, if, if the teacher who was in charge is going to go to a dis different district or maybe move, um, you know, what's the, the state of the classroom going to be? Statement of responsibility will kind of address that. Uh, the budget spreadsheet, um, you know, these go up to $10,000 awards. So hopefully you're not dealing with huge amounts of cash to work on the budget spreadsheet, but we still want to see that it's all eligible and how it's going to be spent. If you do have donations, whether equipment or money, uh, we, we would love to see written confirmation from those partners. That's also a great opportunity to show a deeper level of support. Um, you know, don't just have them say like, I'm giving them this. Say, I'm giving this because, you know, I really believe in this project. Um, we have a timeline. 
the outdoor classroom grant is an 18 month contract. So the timeline is pretty, it's pretty easy. We're not talking about a week to week timeline here. It really is six months by six months by six months. So just let us know that you do have a plan for the construction of this. Um, and then finally, if it is applicable, um, you know, an MOU or a landowner agreement, um, oftentimes if it's just kind of at the school property, this one's easy. If you're doing it at a park um, or wherever, we just want to make sure whoever uh, is, you know, managing the land is built on that they're, they're okay with it. Um, with that, I think we've reached the question and answer part. Um, I guess before I do open it up for questions, I did just want to, on this last last slide, um, you know, I did talk about uh, letters of support and, you know, partners, uh, but I did talk to Amy May of Tree Utah, you know, the wonderful organization in Utah, the executive director there. Uh, I just wanted to give a plug for her um, as a wonderful partner. So if you are considering, you know, tree plantings in the classroom or help designing, uh, Amy May is going to be a great resource. Um, I believe her email is amy at treeutah.org. We can also put that in the chat. So with that, let's go ahead and answer some questions. Um, Feel free to unmute if you have a question and we'll go ahead and, and let them go orally. Also, I can answer some questions and I'm just putting Amy May's email right there. Um, oh, she's put it as well. Uh, there's a couple questions from earlier. Um, one was um, about a project from last year. Um, so if an organization received this grant last year, can they apply again for funds to complete the project? If it's the same project, and this goes for any of our grants, um, no, um, that we, we can't fund the same project twice. Now, unless you applied for a phase one um, of the project, um, and you said, this is what we're gonna accomplish in phase one, because it's pretty ambitious. Then you can come back to us with phase two. Um, but if you, you've you uh, explained the project in, in the application that you're doing, so this is a warning to anybody who's got a very ambitious project. Um, if, if you have explained it and, in full in your application, that is what you are uh, given a contract for with that award. So um, yeah, I would say, for example, if you wanted to, if, if you have the space in the land and you're gonna do one outdoor classroom, maybe it's more traditional sitting area, and then you're gonna do something that's a little bit more oriented around the science or something else, and you've got stations, for example, um, you can apply for that in a different phase. We have no problem, um, and that goes for any of our grants, of applying uh, each year for a, you know, a different project or a different phase of the project. But please do be aware, for example, you could have your outdoor classroom and then decide, hey, I want to do a greenhouse. Those are two different projects if you've not uh, you know, put those together in your, your same application. So hopefully that helps. Um, and yeah. then municipalities such as a water district, yes, um, that, that would be eligible. Again, uh, be prepared to explain um, how it's, uh, you know, the educational aspects of it. I would say that in one of the um, pictures that we borrowed of, of that um, is one from California and it was a water district um, and it was an outdoor, it's, it's like a octagonal um, pergola with seating underneath. That was a water district there who did host field trips on a regular basis. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good segue to uh, the next question we had, which is, can a site be at a public park or nonprofit cultural center? It absolutely can. I think it's important if it is like out of, you know, off school grounds, for example, um, that you do have a use plan for it. You know, we don't want to just see, you know, a, a few like a classroom set up at a park. And it essentially just becomes a place for people to hang out at the park. So anytime you are planning something, just make sure there's a good use plan. If you're doing field trips there that you have considered how it is going to get used regularly, you know, the, the curriculum is going to be taught there. Um, we just don't want, you know, this to become park infrastructure. We really do want these to be outdoor classrooms. 
Um, it looks like we have another one. Please repeat the required match cash and or other. So, you know, as a UORG grant, it is uh, within the UORG re requirement. So it goes up to a $10,000 uh, award. And then there is a one-to-one -one match. Um, and then 50% of your match does need to be cash. So if it were a $20,000 project, you could have a $10,000 award, you put in $5,000 of cash, and then you would have uh, $5,000 being kind. Um, and, you know, all of those can be combinations of partners and your own applicant cash or in kind. And, and that in kind, um, just to be really uh, clear, has to be for the completion of the infrastructure. It cannot be for the programming later. If we do get back the UCOR funding, you can that that kind of uh, programming um, help match is is a part of it. Um, and then regular basis. Um, you know, it, all I'm saying is, uh, you know, it, it, the more frequently it's used, uh, probably, and you know, the more firm your plans, uh, the better you'll score. Um, I would say, Patrick, uh, is there a rough estimate of how many applied versus how many were given? Or would you say it was like a 50-50? awarding yeah. or was it somewhere like that so I would say it's if, roughly 50 50 yeah so if you don't want to fall into the bottom half um i would say a, a more frequent use we don't have a definition um but you know they're just going to look at it and say how often is this going to be used and is there a good roi as far as if this is used 12 times a year and we're giving 10 um thousand dollars in an award you know is it, are they going to say hmm that i don't know if that's frequent enough but um, yeah i think yeah. in the end you know the more frequent the better use plan the more competitive it will be um you know relative to to the ask um so you know while we don't have a hard definition of what is frequent or you know what is normal use um the more it's used the better you know it, it's it's Pretty straightforward on that one. Um, and I also, I think we still do have Alex and Derek online. So if anybody has questions for them, feel free to put those in the chat as well. Um, is there a cap on total amount of funding available in 2022 for these grants? And if so, what is the cap? So it, I think a lot depends on the quality of the applications. I, last year, our initial cap was uh, $100,000, if I believe. And we mm -hmm. almost doubled that because we were so impressed with the quality. And when I say we, it's our, really it's our scoring committee who makes these decisions. So we might set out for something similar, um, but I anticipate with with the you know if we have a similar amount of requests, you know we'll we'll probably hit that one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollar mark. Uh, but you know last year we, once again we did set out to say like we'll give out one hundred thousand um, and then give give out a significant amount more. So so we don't have a cap. Um, and then what was I? going to add uh, with that we do have a number of materials that should be of help to you including that program guide as patrick mentioned that will have some of the things answered for this this is a a, a little more streamlined application um, but uh, i i would just add that uh, the other part is we are here to help you we are not the scores we will um, be the ones that will filter out things that are blatantly ineligible for some reason. So um, do not um, uh, do do not be shy about reaching out to Patrick or I and asking us for a little help. Matter of fact, we do have an early deadline um, of the end of February. So if you reach out to us by then, you say my application's in draft. Would you give it a look over? We are kind of your advocates to make sure that you put forth the best application possible. And, uh, you know, we will make some recommendations. We're not going to write your application for you by any means, but uh, we're there to help. And then, um, and Derek can answer this question as well. Um, but if you do have an ambitious project, you're not ready to go, um, maybe uh, what you know, Derek's provided, you're thinking, I need a little more help, or I'm doing something really unique, or, um, and Derek could probably answer to this, uh, on behalf of USU, Derek, um, USU um, has um, 
a great landscape and architecture program. And, you know, they can take a handful of projects such as this, perhaps as a school uh, classroom project. So if, if you're wanting to think about something for 2023, um, next year, this might be a good time to reach out to them and or the National Park Services RTCA program, who can also help you with that. They did it for Bachman Elementary, who I believe got one last year, Patrick, if I'm not wrong. Um, so they help do their outdoor classroom design. So there are a number of resources. And there we go. Brandon's provided that information. Um, so uh, that is another awesome source. And as you can see, there is that up there. And then Sandra asked, can the grant be used for public restrooms? Um, no, this is, this is for outdoor classrooms. However, Sandra, our other grant, um, if this public restroom is at a trailhead and it is pretty much just a restroom at the trailhead and there's not much else to it, you could apply for our other mini grant. Um, if you have much more than that, like public restroom, kiosk, parking lot, a little bit more to the, you know, something for the beginning of the trailhead, then you can apply, then that might be well over, you're gonna want more over $10,000 and you'll wanna apply for a regular Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant. But um, anyway, and thank you. <laughs> um, Al Alex has provided her information as well. You have a lot of people here who wanna support you. And- um, And I also just put Hillary Lambert, she's the, um, I believe her title CEO of the Wasatch Mountain Institute. Um, she's an environmental education consultant. She helped us with this presentation and developed this grant. So um, her email is in the chat as well. And Francis, um, you asked about cash match. So at least half of your match uh, should be cash. The applicant should have some skin in the game. So in other words, um, you could have another grant um, possibly that that goes into this if, if there are other grants out there. Um, but you need to have some of your own cash in the mix. But, um, you know, say you're applying for a $10,000 um, outdoor classroom grant, which is the max, you know, that's $5,000 worth of cash, maybe, you know, a couple thousand of that is, is an additional grant that may be pending or something. Um, you know, there's, there's different ways to do it, but I have been um, really pleasantly surprised at the community support. Once your communities know that what you're trying to do, um, you know, it has been wonderful to see, you know, school parents, uh, school children's parents holding fundraisers and donating, like contractors donating their time and material and so forth. Uh, please don't underestimate the support you can get in your community. Um, and Sandra said there's a trailhead next to a historic house. The restroom would be used by two audiences. That sounds like it could be a winner, Sandra. Reach out to us. Um, but yeah, that wouldn't be the outdoor classroom grant, but it would be maybe one of our others. And um, we can talk to you about the elements of that and how to really strengthen it. Um, you know, the more you ask, the more money you ask, and that goes for any of our grants. You know, if you're asking for, for a half million dollars from our other grant, the more you ask for, the more that it's expected. So um, these mini grants, um, aren't uh, quite as, so the, the applications are streamlined. We don't need as much information, um, but it sounds like you've got um, a tourism aspect to that. So you could ask for more, so please reach out. Um, can this grant, uh, no, you cannot match one of our grants with another one of our grants. Um, sorry about that one. Um, you can um, use other grants. I. For those that want like things like uh, sunshades and that kind of thing um, for your outdoor classroom, please uh, look and research out there. I know the American Academy of Dermatologists trying to prevent uh, skin cancer have had um, 
opportunities where they have provided uh, funds for uh, some kind of shades from the sun, um, look into kind of Lowe's and Home Depot for additional uh, grant opportunities. Sometimes those are super competitive. Um, sometimes you can just talk your local hardware store into donations. Um, if, uh, and this is, this is down into the weeds a little bit, um, but uh, sometimes what you can do with a, uh, something like a, a local hardware store, if they're providing a significant discount for your project, what you might try asking them for, say they said, we'll knock 30% off, um, ask, or you know, a third off, um, ask them if instead they would for every, say two you buy, um, or so that they, you know, a proportion that they might uh, donate. So instead of them um, just discounting it, um, have them donate, you know, a portion of that for each, um, you know, for the portion that you buy, and then please provide um, some kind of documentation saying the the um, the value of that. That can be used for in kind. Um, as well, and um, that's a great way to do it. Um, in you um, just just please go ask those people. I used to help with a nonprofit um, getting getting money, and um, you you lose nothing by asking and sitting down with people. It I, I'd be surprised at um, how many times people used to say yes when I asked. So try that. Can I add something to that, Tara? Yeah. I was also surprised doing the case studies by how many of them were funded by donations and all materials were just given and design and construction services all donated in multiple case studies. And the one at Greenwood Charter School where we did the uh, public input process, we created a survey and sent it out to all the parents and teachers. I think we had about 40 respondents and many of them put in what they were willing to donate to the project specifically. So. Um, if you if you send out a survey, which I've actually have included in, in the design guide, there's a link to a pre-created survey that I made uh, with all the questions that you could that you could want to ask. If you send that out, it, you'll have a list there of, of anyone who responds what they're willing to donate. So that's a really good resource too for you to use. Thank you, Derek. That's perfect. That's that's the kind of information that we we need. If somebody has purchased something for you and has the receipt or some kind of statement of that, that's a cash match or will purchase. I should say, um, use these, use make these purchases during the course of that, as opposed to donate and here's the value of it. Um, but if, if somebody else has made those purchases and donated it for you, that will count as your cash match. Um, and then Sarah Jo asks, uh, can other state grants be used? Um, for example, the Invasive Species Mitigation Grant. Um, if they're willing to pay for things along here, that's fine. Just as long as it's not our grant, we um, we're not picky. If you can, if you're able to get a a grant, um, I know uh, one other one out there is the STEM Action Center, but I think theirs is more programming oriented and not infrastructure. But you never know, reach out to them. Um, and um, yeah, I wish. Um, one, one other thing, Tara, just to mm -hmm. your previous comment about USU. Uh, yes, we offer free design service and consultation. There's a link on the very last page of the design guide. Well, technically second to last page. There's a link where you can click on and it takes you to the project inquiry form for USU. And that'll go to their extension office. You just got to put in your information and give a little description. And then um, my supervisor will review those and then get with you. And if we're available, they can put students on it. And I know last year, some applications had help from USU's design services. And then in addition to that, on the second to last page of the design guide, there's a, there's a sheet of resources and other companies throughout the nation that offer design services as well that can help if you guys are feeling overwhelmed by the design process. So check those out. Um, there's there's plenty of people willing to help. Thanks so much, and and you know I appreciate all the work that Derek has done in the past year 
for this. And um, if there is anybody listening on there now that does these kind of design services and you're not um, included in that and you'd like to be um, as being willing to help, um, reach out to us. We'll add you to the next edition of that uh, program, that update of, of the um, design guide. So um, happy to do that for, for those that are listening. Um, but yeah, just we're, we're here to keep answering questions long after this is over. Um, you know, you might sleep on something and think about a few things and, and reach out to us next week after the application has opened. Well, I would just like to say thank you to all of our presenters, to Alex and Derek, thank you to Tara. Um, and of course, thank you to everybody here. You all are, are doing so much on the ground and we're so happy to support. Um, please reach out to us. Uh, we have our contact information. We've listed a few times. Um, here's just one more slide with Alex, uh, myself and Tara's. Um, we have Derek's in the chat. I also put Hillary Lambert's in the chat, um, who is also a wonderful resource. Um, throughout the cycle, uh, reach out. We are here to help. Um, it's opening on January 18th, uh, which is next Tuesday. So get ready, use the guide. Um, and you know we can't wait to see what wonderful opportunities you're going to give to you know, K through 12 students. And, and should I also mention, Patrick, you've created some mini videos on going through the online application process and so forth. Yep. So yeah, if you have any trouble, uh, you know, navigating the online portal, we'll have like quick little five minute how to videos with some slides just to kind of walk you through that process. So, okay. Thank you, everyone. Well, with that, thank you, everybody, and go enjoy your evening. Take care. <laughs>